Hello, welcome back for another video. Sometimes I have parents who reach out to me because I am a member of the IOMT, which is a biologic dentist organization. Um, and those parents tell me what they're looking for and ask me if they're looking for a unicorn or if it actually exists. So it's already a challenge sometimes to find either a biologic dentist or an airway focused dentist, depending on where you are. And when you're looking for both options to be true at once, then sometimes it really can narrow down the options for who's available to help you. You might need both types of providers on your team, and I think it's absolutely okay to have, to seek help from more than one dentist in this case. If you want both types of provider and you can find someone who does both, that's absolutely amazing and great too. Some of you aren't even looking for biological dentists. Some of you may never have even heard of this type of provider or have an interest in the way that they approach dental care. But for those parents who've been asking about it, I do wanna just walk through each of these paths so you understand a little bit better about the priorities for each type of dentist. So as I mentioned, I myself discovered biological dentistry um, through the IUMT. Uh, I discovered that before kind of going down the rabbit hole of airway dentistry, but these are a few organizations that can help you if you are looking for biologic providers. I'll include some links in the description for this video. One of the first main topics in biological dentistry is looking at material selection. So what's considered safe versus what's considered to be more toxic. And even in some cases doing specific testing to figure out your own unique biological compatibility. If you're gonna have metal fillings removed, for example, there is a specific safe mercury amalgam removal technique you should look into, um, or testing to check if your mercury levels in your body are higher or not. So even with non-metal materials, there are BPA-free options and other considerations. And a biological office is typically going to take all of this into consideration. Another important topic in this genre is root canal therapy. A root canal is a procedure where the inside nerve tissue of a tooth is removed. The tooth gets to remain in place, but the nerve tissue has been replaced. So it's kind of like a taxidermy tooth. The question becomes how thoroughly was that area cleaned out? And what is the implication of this dead zone remaining in our living body? So this is one area where I like to point out that a pediatric root canal is significantly different, in my opinion, from a root, uh, from an adult root canal. I'm much more likely to recommend somebody proceed with a baby root canal, uh, and I'm more cautious to consider an adult root canal, as there can be other options to consider. But for both of these scenarios, both the technique and the material comes into play, for how successful a procedure like this will be. Despite the name, uh, when a root canal is done on a baby tooth, it actually isn't filling up the whole root space in the same way that it would in an adult tooth. Also important to keep in mind that these are temporary solutions in a child's tooth that will last at most a few years versus a treatment that in an adult is expected to last for decades to come. And with extractions, biologic dentists are gonna be much more concerned about the extraction site and how that is managed on the day of surgery and following up to ensure proper healing has taken place. When improper healing takes place, it can be a silent driver for inflammation in the body. Again, it's gonna be less controversial in the case that the extraction is taking place for a baby tooth. An adult tooth is going to eventually move in to replace that baby tooth and it will remodel the bone and how that heals in that area. Bacteria is important for biological dentists. So in some cases that's promotion of good bugs for a healthy microbiome or alternatively testing for specific harmful bacteria that could be contributing to oral diseases or be preventing healing in the case of cavities or gum disease, other considerations. In biological dentistry, there's gonna be more consideration for how our environment influences our health. This can sometimes be a little more alternative with things like electromagnetic frequencies. 
And there's also just a focus, a broader focus on whole body health. The mouth is a part of the whole body, so it really doesn't make sense to treat it independently. We need to look at the bi-directional relationship of oral and systemic health. To be fair, this concept is one shared by the airway-focused dentist, but just through a slightly different lens with different priorities. Airway-focused dentistry is highly concerned with jaw and facial development and the implications that this will have on the rest of the body, knowing full well that we have the power to influence growth from a young age. While this is still going to be a more holistic approach to dentistry, it's not necessarily presented as alternative health like, like biologic dentistry can be. We are looking at the nasal cavity and oropharyngeal airway space, also honing in on the relationships of the upper and lower jaws with each other. Postural and spinal alignment becomes more important here as well. Sleep is a central factor. How our faces develop influences how we breathe. How we breathe drives how we sleep, and how we sleep drives our overall health. So sleep can be a focus in several biological offices as well, same with posture. Um, but sometimes the solutions that are offered are going to just vary. And also, just based on the age of a patient, what's offered might, might vary as well. And airway-focused dentists will likely spend more time on tooth positioning, but the ultimate goal is not straight teeth. The ultimate goal is having adequate growth to support proper functions of nasal breathing, chewing, swallowing, etc. And tongue function plays a significant role here. Some airway providers might be offering phenectomies and others are offering myofunctional or other dental appliances. There's no set definition of what an airway-focused dentist is going to offer in their practice. So you'll have to investigate what services any dental clinic is offering and determine if that's the kind of help you believe you're looking for. So who is an airway dentist and how does this differ from an orthodontist? That's another question I get asked. So an orthodontist is a dentist who's gone on to get a postgraduate degree, allowing them to officially be called a specialist. An airway dentist could be an orthodontist, or they could be a pediatric dentist, a general dentist, or even oral surgeons or periodontists. It just depends on what services they're offering. For example, phrenectomies or corrective jaw surgeries are still airway-focused procedures. There's no true postgraduate program in dental schools allowing one to be called an airway dentist or even a biological dentist for that matter. There definitely are organizations that have taken on the responsibility to create certifications to kind of validate the training that a provider has, but it's not considered a true dental specialty as recognized by the American Dental Association. All that being said, traditionally, orthodontists were not trained to start seeing young children. They often would wait until early teen years to begin treatment. So what kind of happened is that more pediatric dentists or general dentists started to pick up the cases for some of these younger patients when problems were being identified. Airway dentists are going to be concerned earlier about poor oral habits that prevent improper development, whereas an orthodontist may never see a child that young because orthodontists often only see patients who are referred to their practice. Appliances like expanders could be used early by either an orthodontist or an airway-focused dentist. And airway dentists might focus more on nasal hygiene, lip seal, things like that. They're always going to be working collaboratively with myofunctional therapists and other providers. And then, of course, what most orthodontists are known for are your classic braces, um, but they do also offer a variety of dental appliances. More orthodontists are getting involved in treating younger cases, which is great, but historically that was not the case. And orthodontic consultations are recommended for all children now at around age seven. But if you're detecting any problems earlier than age seven, finding someone who can help is important. Finding interventions for younger children can be really difficult depending on who is near you, which providers are near you. But if you take your seven-year-old to the dentist and you're told they're going to need braces someday, but there's nothing we can do until around age 12 or 13, that definitely makes me pause because there's always something that can be done in the meantime. If you want to talk through various treatment solutions or need help finding a provider near you, 
connect with me for a free consult to find out ways that I might be able to help your family. And thank you so much for watching this video, listening to what I have to say. I hope that you found it helpful. Thanks.